Thank you all for joining us this morning at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, U.S., um, the Washington home of the IISS. My name is Sam Karak. I'm the Senior Fellow for Russia and Eurasia at the IISS. Um, the IISS, for those of you who uh, don't know us, is a global think tank um, with a total of four fully fledged offices, including our mothership in London, uh, but also in Bahrain, Singapore, and here in D.C. Uh, the Bahrain and Singapore offices um, grew out of our two regional security dialogues uh, that the Institute has pioneered over the last uh, decade, the Manama Dialogue in the Middle East and the Shangri-La Dialogue in the Asia Pacific. The Institute also has a number of well-known publications, I'm sure most of you are aware of, including Survival, The Military Balance, and the Adelphi Book Series, some of which are on the display table in the back. But enough about us. We're honored today to be hosting Derek Chalet, um, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs. In that role, um, see if that works any better. Uh, he's the principal advisor to the Secretary of Defense on international security strategy and policy related to the countries and international organizations of Europe, including NATO, the Middle East, Africa, and the Western Hemisphere. He also has oversight for security cooperation programs, including foreign military sales in these regions. Previously, he served President Obama, uh, a special assistant to the president and senior director for strategic planning on the National Security Council staff, and as principal deputy director of the Secretary of State's policy planning staff. But Derek is no stranger to the think tank world. Um, before he joined the Obama-Biden transition team, he was a senior fellow at the Center for New American Security, uh, and has also been a fellow at Brookings and CSIS. He has written a number of books on American foreign policy, including this one, America Between the Wars, uh, co-authored with Jim Goldberg, now at American University, which I might have the opportunity to use against him today. Um, but Derek has agreed to do something uh, very unique this morning. Uh, instead of reading you prepared remarks, he has offered to do this session today as a moderated conversation, which is why we're sitting in these chairs. Um, basically, that means that I have the opportunity to ask him a number of tough questions for the next 20 to 30 minutes, uh, and then I'll ask you to all join me in the interrogation uh, until we wrap up around 11. Um, so Derek, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for doing this. In talking about this event, um, we had a little bit of a back and forth of our email about the meaning of European security today. Um, so I want to start with the big picture. Uh, are we returning to a sort of Cold War era, continent-centric definition of that concept? Or um, will, broadly speaking, NATO and uh, European security with large be conceived of still beyond the confines of the, uh, the territory of the European continent itself? Will NATO remain an out-of-area organization? Uh, well, Sam, first of all, thank you for having me here. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Just give me some feedback. Okay, good? All right. Uh, and sorry, I feel like the folks in the back can't see, but I'll try to. I'm a man of short stature, but I'll try to uh, try to sit up straight. Um, and it, but it's great to be at Double I Double S. In, in this job, uh, I have had the pleasure of being and I think every IISS major conference uh, that you've had uh, with the Secretary of Defense. Uh, and it's, it's wonderful to be here in Washington. This is the first time I've actually been in the IISS uh, facilities here in Washington. So it's my pleasure to be here with this conversation, for this conversation with you, but also uh, all of you. And it's good to see so many old friends uh, in the audience today. Um, on your question, I, I don't think we're, we're returning to the Cold War. Uh, I think, unfortunately, the world a lot more complex than the Cold War. Uh, that's sort of the cliche. It's one that, it's one that uh, Jim and I write about in our book, and many of you have been writing about for the last quarter century, since the end of the Cold War. Uh, but it's clear that what we have seen on, in the last eight or nine months uh, in Europe shows that European security and the, the, the effort that is, is uh, bipartisan, that uh, has, has been uh, worked for for 25 years to create a Europe whole, free, and at peace is still a project that uh, requires our attention and uh, requires um, a lot of our creative thinking. Um, it's you know we've had tremendous progress in Europe as we all know since the end of the Cold War and, and, and NATO is in 
what you would say, it, maybe it's it's fifth phase. First one being the Cold War, of course. Uh, uh, second, uh, the immediate post-Cold War era, where um, many people around town uh, were, were saying that NATO had, had lost its, its purpose and there was no reason to have NATO absent the Soviet Empire. Um, and the, the Clinton administration and uh, many influential outsiders answer that question that NATO still served a purpose, first to keep security within the European continent in the Balkans, but also uh, to help enlarge the, the span of peace and prosperity in Europe through NATO enlargement. Uh, that's a project that I think it's worth noting that was extremely controversial at the time, and anyone who considered themselves a serious foreign policy person, most people who consider themselves a serious foreign policy person, from George Kennan and Tom Friedman to many others, all thought the NATO enlargement was a crazy idea. Uh, we're looking back, particularly from the perspective of 20 years, uh, I think uh, uh, NATO enlargement was a huge success, and I'm very happy that we have an enlarged alliance, and we saw the importance of an enlarged alliance on display at the Wales Summit uh, in September. Uh, then, of course, uh, we had NATO's efforts throughout the 90s to try to keep the peace uh, in Europe, and that's, uh, as I mentioned, in, in Bosnia, but also in Kosovo. Then we had the NATO post-9-11 era, where NATO, again, um, faced an existential issue, which is how far out of area should the alliance go? <coughs> remember, in the 90s, the bumper sticker was out of area or out of business. Of course, out of area then meant outside of the immediate sphere of NATO member countries in the Balkans was what was considered out of area. But then, of course, in the 2000s, uh, we had Afghanistan. And one of the huge accomplishments of the NATO alliance uh, it's in, in the years since 9-11 has been the role that it has played in Afghanistan. And we have many member countries, well, all member countries there, but the majority of member countries in the fight taking casualties sacrificing in real ways in Afghanistan. Now, of course, this year we are in a transition period uh, away from the, from, the, from the ISAF mission to the train, advise, and assist mission towards the end of the year, and, and we are on track for that mission. And we are, uh, we are resourcing that mission with U.S. forces, but then also with NATO forces. But then that, that's when we approach what I would say is NATO's fourth phase, which is uh, the current moment. Heading into the Wales Summit, uh, after we were meeting here a year ago, we would be talking about uh, the next ex existential crisis for NATO, which is what is NATO for post-Afghanistan? And what are the other challenges around the world that the NATO alliance should seek to try to tackle? We still have many of the challenges we would have talked about a year ago, certainly in the Middle East uh, and elsewhere. We still have, we'll have unfinished business in Afghanistan. But what has happened in the last year, really this calendar year, has shown that we still have a lot of work to do still in Europe. Uh, that shoring up our Eastern European, Central and Eastern European NATO partners and, and allies. It's also working with a non-NATO partner states, countries in the Balkans, countries like Ukraine, to help build up their militaries, their defenses, strengthen the partnership that the alliance has with those countries. But still, as, as I mentioned, also uh, uh, working with our NATO allies, uh, whether it's through the alliance or just in our bilateral relationships on issues like the fight against ISIL. And I think one of the, one of the great um, accomplishments of the Wales Summit was the unity that the alliance showed in the fight against ISIL and the willingness of many NATO allies to step up and contribute in a meaningful way uh, to that fight, and we've seen that play out over the last several weeks in the, in the, uh, since the, the Wales Summit. Thanks. So, when it came into office, the Obama administration, I think, was operating under uh, on a premise that um, part of making working with Europe to effectively address global challenges was uh, also empowering Europe to deal with. Um, uh, to take the training wheels off, and so, so to speak, and let Europe take the lead on Europe's remaining regional problems, um, while, of course, uh, partnering um, with them as well. And the U.S. military continues to view um, a stable Europe as key to its global operations, often referring to the continent as its quote-unquote global platform. It, is that over now, um, in, in light of the Ukraine crisis? I mean, how, what are the implications of protracted instability on NATO's borders for 
the U.S. and NATO ability to address global problems together in other regions? Well, I think it's again, it's it's not a it's not a clean trade-off where NATO is only worried about what's going on in the transatlantic space, or it's worried about what's going on in the Middle East and North Africa. It's got to do both. And as, as you're all well aware, there is tension within the alliance between those partners, uh, just due to geography, between those partners who who are uh, closest to uh, to Russia and the instability that that Russia is is exporting, and those that are closest to Middle East and North Africa, the Southern Alliance members: Portugal, Spain, Italy, Greece, Turkey. Uh, and it's, it's in our efforts, we have worked to both reassure our Central and Eastern European partners, and, that, and that's through the, the, uh, the, the RAP, the Reassurance Action Plan that we agreed to at the Wales Summit. That's an alliance-wide effort to try to put together a robust program of rotational deployments, uh, pre-positioning of equipment, uh, exercise programs to work with our Central and Eastern European allies. Uh, to ensure that their capability is as robust as it can be and that we are postured and positioned in a way that we can help reassure them and deal with any contingency that they may face. But then at the same time, working with our uh, Southern European partners, uh, and we've done a lot of work, uh, particularly with Spain and Italy recently, to deal with that, to work with them from a military perspective on dealing with this insecurity that's emanating up from the Middle East and North Africa that they are very focused on. And, and Italy, as, as many of you probably know, uh, is, is facing a major crisis when it comes to migration, blowing up uh, particularly from Libya. Uh, these are both Libyans, but also uh, other sub-Saharan Africans that are using Libya as the, as the exit point up into Europe. And so that's, that's, a, that's a threat to them. That's also a threat to the European continent, as they use Italy to then spread out up through the continent. So we, have, we can't just decide that we're going to handle one or the other. The challenge for the alliance is to handle both. Um, that's why we have worked to, well, through the alliance to work to, to have this reassurance action plan to also then, through the United States, uh, the president earlier this year asked for a billion dollars um, in the European Reassurance Initiative, a uh, billion dollars from Congress to help augment uh, the resources that we are already, we in the United States, are already putting in to Europe. Uh, not just our NATO allies, although the, the majority of it will go to our NATO allies, but also to some of our partner uh, countries to help improve the cooperation that we have uh, with them. We don't have that billion dollars yet from Congress. We're very hopeful when Congress returns uh, in November that we will get that shortly so we can be begin to move out on that program. But the bottom line is we don't have the luxury of choosing. We've got to do both. That's, that's uh, you know, that's why I get paid the big bucks <laughs> to, try, to try to work on that. Part of the reason in your portfolio, I guess, helps in that respect. Um, so the Wales Summit Declaration, uh, 114 paragraphs, I believe, uh, thereof, um, was a lot to take in. Um, can you distill for us uh, the key ta takeaways from the summit and also give us a sense of the atmospherics um, among the leaders? Uh, Sure. I, 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 let me start with the atmospherics, and then I'll give you the key takeaways. I think it was it was a very positive summit. Uh, all summits are important. Anytime you get leaders together, uh, something significant will happen. I I personally feel, and I, I think that that this is uh, a feeling shared by folks above my pay grade uh, in the administration, that it was it was a it was a historic summit, and it's one that we will reflect back upon as, as with other historic summits uh, in the NATO alliance, the Washington summit in '99. Uh, stands out uh, when we first enlarged the alliance after the Cold War. Um, uh, the 1990 London summit with Gorbachev coming. I think Wales will will be remembered as a significant summit, not just because of what we were, uh, the moment in history uh, with the Afghanistan transition, the Ukraine crisis, and the ISIL threat really emerging in, uh, into, the, into the fore, but also uh, what we were able to accomplish. Uh, on, th th there was work that, that was we were working before the, the, the summit, so this was on in, internally within NATO, things like uh, a capabilities initiative, things like an enhanced partners initiative where we identified some core partners, uh, uh, countries like Jordan and Georgia, where there would be enhanced partner programs so the alliance over the next, in the coming years, could work with these partners to deepen the relationship. and and sustain that strong muscle tissue that we developed with partners in the fight in Afghanistan. Because one of the challenges 
the Alliance forces is after Afghanistan, after an active combat mission uh, that's been uh, for the last uh, decade plus, how do we ensure that, that those strong uh, partnerships that we have, so not just the work we have within the 28 of interoperability, but that work that, that, that we've been able to accomplish with the core of NATO, but then with very, very capable partners like the Georgians, like the Australians, like the Jordanians in Afghanistan, how do we sustain that? So that was part of the rationale for this enhanced partner initiative. Also on defense spending. This has been an issue that has riddled us for many, many years. Uh, secretaries of Defense of both parties uh, have, have spoken very plainly about the concerns we, the United States, have about European defense spending. And one of the challenges we face, and I'm sitting at the Defense Department and going to many, many NATO defense ministerials over the past several years, is when defense ministers get together, everyone vigorously agrees with one another that we need, they need to spend more on defense. The challenge is that when everyone goes back to capitals and deals with parliaments and deals with finance ministers and deals with leaders who have to manage the trade-offs of higher defense spending in their own countries, that's when the, the, the trouble uh, comes. So that's why it was important at the summit where those leaders who are making the decisions were around the table to agree to a defense pledge. Uh, now, the real work begins because you've got to fulfill the pledge. We've seen in the news uh, just since the summit some issues, for example, uh, with, with certain very important allies like Germany on their defense readiness. And that brings in to great focus uh, the challenge that our partners have uh, with, with defense spending, defense readiness. That's why we signed on to this pledge, which over the next several years we are going to work very hard with our partners to see that it gets uh, fulfilled. Um, but then the, the, the other accomplishment, I would say, uh, and this circles back to the, to the point about the success of the summit overall, is the degree of unity that was apparent around that table on the issues of the day. So we were able to get the, the hard work done on the internal NATO issues, on partnerships, on capabilities, and on spending, but also uh, on the ISO threat, and, and we were able to use the summit to begin the process of building this coalition that you have all seen uh, continue to grow uh, uh, since the summit. We, that was the beginning of that effort. We had a side meeting there, Secretary Kerry, Secretary Hagel hosted a side meeting with what we then called the Core Coalition, which has, of course, expanded out since, but also on Ukraine. There was an important session of the NATO-Ukraine uh, Commission at the Wales Summit with President Poroshenko there in attendance, <coughs> and what you, what you heard around that table was a lot of support for the Ukrainians, uh, economic support, political support, and also a willingness of alliance partners to work with the Ukrainians in the future to assist their military in becoming more professional and modern. Let's talk about that for a second. Um, we heard from President Obama when President Poroshenko visited that there would be a, an assessment um, made by DOD, presumably under your supervision, uh, of the Ukrainian military and its needs going forward, um, particularly since the dramatic escalation in late um, August, early September. Um, so, this has been the world. Uh, your assessment of the, the state and, and what uh, of, the, of the Ukrainian armed forces and um, plans for US assistance sure. going forward. Sure, Sam, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, first, I, I should say that our assessment is not something that just started when, after President Poroshenko visited. It's, it's something we have been working with the Ukrainians on for the better part of this year, since this crisis erupted. And I think it's important to, to give a, a, some context here, which is, despite the fact that Ukraine has been a NATO partner uh, for several years, and that we've had this NATO-Ukraine uh, commission, and despite the fact that uh, NATO has worked with us in Iraq, and NATO has, or, or Ukraine has worked with, worked with NATO in Iraq, Ukraine has been part of the ISAF coalition. Ukraine has been part of the Kosovo peacekeeping co uh, uh, coalition. We have not, we the United States, have not had a particularly robust defense relationship with Ukraine over the years. Our FMF, for example, was, was in the single digits of, of millions of dollars, uh, which is not much. So this year, we have ramped up that work significantly. And but I want to make that note because the baseline we were starting from was not particularly uh, strong. <clears throat> and in fact, earlier this year, when Secretary Hagel was making phone calls to the then Ukrainian defense minister, the phone calls were mainly focused on ensuring that the Ukrainian military did not roll into the Maidan and uh, take out the protesters. 
so this was a military we, that, that has some, some immense challenges, deeply rooted challenges, corruption, uh, uh, training challenges. And, and by the way, they are, uh, to their credit, very open with us right now about these challenges and asking for our assistance in helping them manage uh, through them. So since the spring, we have had, uh, through UCOM, the European Command, a, a, a bilateral working group that's led at the flag officer <coughs> level with the Ukrainians. And it's, there's about once every six weeks, we have a team going to Ukraine to talk to them about defense reform issues. Uh, I, I was in Ukraine in June to, to meet with the senior leadership and the then defense minister has been removed, I think, twice since then, uh, two times removed, uh, to talk about ways that we can work, them, work with them not only on their urgent needs, which of course they have, but also their medium to long term needs, uh, which are uh, extremely important as we, as, we, as we try to think through the U.S. relationship with Ukraine over the next several years. So. When President Poroshenko was here, he, of course, uh, talked to the president, talked to many of us about the urgent needs they have and also the medium and long-term interest or needs they have and the interest uh, they have in working with us. So last week, we had two teams go to Ukraine from UCOM, a medical assistance team, but also <coughs> a, a defense reform team to talk to them about ways we can build a very strong program that in the coming years can help that military reform. Now, that's not going to help them in the next week. Uh, it's not going to help them the, for the rest of this year. This is, this is an effort that is going to take months and months of work. And it's not something the US, by the way, can just do alone. And this is something we're talking to our NATO partners about. NATO has a liaison office in Kiev that many uh, alliance members have contributed personnel to. So part of, the, part of our effort for the alliance is to ensure that NATO works up a robust uh, uh, partnership program with the Ukrainians. On the assistance and the urgent assistance that they need, we've, we are now, we've gone from the single digit of millions of dollars to now uh, around, I think, $116 million just this year uh, of assistance that we're providing for the Ukrainians uh, and, and their military, their security forces, their border security forces. And that is uh, everything from body armor and night vision goggles to medical uh, uh, maybe things like uniforms. There was something in the New York Times recently I mean, written from the perspective of a Ukrainian soldier saying that, that this person had to pay out of pocket just for basic soldiering equipment. So we've been working to provide that. Uh, and that, that we are also working um, um, on, on further non-lethal assistance. President Poshiko, as you all know, is, is, has been asking us uh, for lethal assistance. Uh, that's not something that we have decided to do at the moment. Um, that's not something that any country has decided to do at the moment. Um, but what we are interested in doing for the, right now is building a work program that may eventually get to that point. Uh, but I think it's, it's prudent to <coughs> crawl, then walk, then run when it comes to our relationship with the Ukrainian military. So we're willing to do a lot. We are doing a lot. I should note that the $116 million in assistance we're providing is assistance that was not budgeted for Ukraine last year. So we've been having Rob Peter to pay Paul uh, when it comes to assistance for Ukraine this year. We're hoping that next year, with the European Reassurance Initiative and the $1 billion we would hopefully get from Congress, where we'll have some more money that's budgeted to assist Ukraine. Uh, but so we're, so we're deeply committed to, to assisting them, and we are doing a lot. It's also, by the way, I should note, something that we are uh, really pressing our partners to assist Ukraine. Some, par some partners have stepped up, Poland, for example, but on the, on the defense side, there's, uh, there's a lot of work I think our partners can, can try to do with Ukraine, and we're urging them to step up as well. From a, um, on a practical level on, on the ground, we've seen in terms of the fighting that's occurred over the last six to nine months um, that the, armed, the formal armed forces are often not uh, in the lead, that there's been either forces under the command of the Ministry of Interior in Ukraine or volunteer <coughs> battalions, as, they, as they're called. Does that present challenges for our, our own assistance, which I imagine is mostly targeted at the Ministry of Defense and, and its armed forces? Uh, it, it does present challenges. That's one of the reasons why we are so interested in putting together a program for defense reform. Uh, I should note, though, that of the, of the $116 million I, I mentioned, a significant portion of that is going to the border security uh, 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 bureaucracy. So it's going, I mean, it's the same kind of equipment. It's surveillance equipment, it's vehicles, uh, it's things to help them secure their border. Obviously, that's a huge problem. Uh, 
And um, so it's not only to the military, but I think what we've seen happen in the last several months, particularly uh, uh, since Russia has been in the fight, and, and what we saw over the summer where the Ukrainians were able to make some progress on the ground, when it was, it was principally a fight with the separatists, with, with still with Russian backing, but with, with less significant Russian backing than, than we later saw uh, towards the end of the summer, the Ukrainians were able to gain some ground. And then when Russia uh, went in in a much more significant way, uh, in a much more visible way to all of us, that's when the Ukrainians really uh, started to have some problems. So uh, it is, as they will, they will say uh, very honestly and, and without any hesitation us, they have a military that's still trained in, you know, in the Soviet system. They have huge corruption problems. Uh, they need help with, with think basic uh, tasks like budgeting and planning. Um, and and uh, training and so there's a whole host of things that they, they, they need and because of the, the the losses they've taken on the battlefield the sacrifices they made and disorganization that it does make working with them a challenge but that's why we have to work with them because we have it we want a strong Ukraine we want a strong Ukrainian military we want a Ukrainian military that has a a strong partnership with the United States that's why we're working so hard to come up with, <coughs> with a, our kind of medium term, medium and long term game plan to do so. But it's not going to be something we're going to do this week or, or you know, by the end of the year. It's, it, we've got to put, this, put these kind of lines of effort in place and then be patient and persistent in pursuing them. Um, and, and understand that there's going to be some zigs and zags along the way. But I, I feel much better about our defense relationship with Ukraine today than I did a year ago in the sense of the depth of, of conversation we're having, the amount of contacts we have, not just from a civilian perspective, but also, uh, importantly, from a military perspective. And if we take a step back, you know, clearly the Ukraine crisis has precipitated a broader deterioration of Russia's relationship with the United States, NATO, and the EU. Um, what's your take on uh, how we got to where we are? In that uh, in that context, uh, and how things unraveled so dramatically and so quickly, and how long do you think we can expect to be in this state that we are in today, where contacts are minimized? Um, basically, only the things that we absolutely have to talk to the Russians about. Do we talk to the Russians about? Um, and uh, is this uh, could that last indefinitely in your view? So I'm half tempted to throw the question back at you since you work these issues <laughs> politically except the yeah. State Department. Uh, but um, look, we've been clear, the President's been clear, that that uh, Russia, if, if it behaves differently, if it if it behaves responsibly, if it stops um, uh, uh, pursuing policies that destabilize its neighborhood that Russia could be a welcome partner of, of NATO, of the United States, of the West. We, we have a lot of common interest with Russia. Uh, and one of the things we have worked hard uh, to ensure throughout this crisis is while we have deep disagreements with Russia, uh, uh, and that, that made very clear, both in word and deed, that they need to be punished for their unacceptable behavior, we do have areas where we seek to cooperate with them still whether that's on the Iran nuclear negotiations, whether that's in the Syria chemical weapons uh, effort of last year, uh, which did succeed in getting the chemical weapons out of Syria. But uh, the, the aspirations that, that we've had for Russia over really now going back 20 years uh, of having a, a deep global partnership or working across a range of issues in common effort, that's on hold right now. Uh, from a Defense Department perspective, we, we, we've, we've sort of ceased all all activity with Russia in terms of basic dialogue, discussions, the defense diplomacy uh, work that I do. Um, and you know, other than our normal, as you noted, our normal diplomatic uh, engagement, Secretary Kerry with Foreign Minister Lavrov, trying to work with them on the issues of the day, there's been very little, uh, very little interaction. Uh, how long it can go? It can go a while. Uh, it's really, the, the, it's, it's up to Russia. Uh, we've made very clear our position. We've made very clear um, uh, the sort of where we stand. We've also, I think our European partners have also been very clear on this. And the level of frustration 
that, that I've seen from our European friends uh, about what's going on uh, inside Russia, uh, many problems inside Russia, but also what's going on on, the, on Russia's periphery is something that throughout Europe uh, there, is, there is deep condemnation of. Um, and I think that, that Russia's further isolation from the international economy, it's further isolation <coughs> diplomatically, uh, it's further isolation really as a society, is it's a direction, it's a path that Russia can choose to take. Uh, I think our, what we can control, and, and, and that's why we've designed policies to try to pursue this, is to work to ensure we're shoring up the partners, the, the, the NATO <coughs> allies, first and foremost, but then secondly, those on Russia's periphery who are in Putin's crosshairs. Uh, Secretary Hagel, after the Wales summit, went to Georgia. Uh, that was not by mistake that he went to Georgia after the Wales summit. We thought, thought it was important to uh, uh, go there in, in what was the first Secretary of Defense visit since 2003 uh, to Georgia to talk to them about what not just what we accomplished at the NATO at the Wales summit, but also what we're going to be doing together in the future. Um, so to show up the partners, to show up the allies, and, and to show the Russians that, that there is there are consequences uh, for their behavior, but at the same time, making it clear that there is a path out, that, that this is not a permanent steady state that we seek. It's, it's, it is solely driven by their unacceptable behavior. So you mentioned uh, states on the border and the crosshairs. Um, we've heard a lot about potential threats to our uh, Baltic allies in this context. I wanted to uh, stipulating to the need for the reassurance measures that have been undertaken and will be undertaken. Um, What's your assessment of the nature of the threat to the, to the Baltic states? And, and, you know, is this a, a place where we can expect little green men to appear in, in, in years, the years to come? Well, uh, we have to be ready for that. And it's, I think there, there is a threat to the Baltics. It's something certainly uh, our, our Baltic friends um, are very worried about, and we talk to them quite a bit about it. And it's not by mistake that before the Wales summit, the president went to Estonia. Uh, so that's one of the re that's the key reason why uh, we have we have pursued this European reassurance initiative to uh, and the and and the uh, the RAP the reassurance action plan to uh, help bolster the confidence and the capabilities of our Central and Eastern European partners. I myself will be back in the region, Poland and the Balts, towards the end of this month to continue defense talks with them on all of these issues. And General Breedlove, who's in town this week, just saw him yesterday at the Pentagon, he'll be back there again today to meet with the President, um, is, is also very focused on reassuring these partners, but then also looking at uh, the asymmetric threats that Russia is posing to NATO allies, to, to non-NATO partners, whether it's in cyber, whether it's in the irregular uh, warfare, the use of special forces and the so-called little green men. And that's, that's, a, that's a policy issue. It's also a doctrinal issue that our military leaders are looking into and trying to ensure that we have the best possible uh, capability and posture to, to combat against. Well, I've asked you a number of questions so far. I think I'm going to now give you all the opportunity to do the same. So I will um, recognize folks who put their hands up. And please identify yourself before you ask your question. Right here in the front. Yes. And wait for the microphone, I should say. Okay. <coughs> thank you, and thanks for doing this, Eric. I'm Indira Lakshman from Bloomberg News. Um, I want to ask you about this perception that the folks in Europe who made it into NATO enlargement and made it into EU enlargement are the lucky ones, but now the door has sort of slammed shut behind them and that everyone else is just out of luck. And uh, I want to know, you know, yes, we've certainly heard the argument that allowing Ukraine into NATO would only further provoke Russia, but tell us a little bit about what your thinking is of how much the door should be kept open and the fact that the um, association agreement with the EU was put off has really put down the spirits of many Ukrainians who think that Europe and the U.S. have basically given up, shrugged their shoulders and said this is the best we can do and the ceasefire line is the new line. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Uh So the door remains widely open. Uh, it is it is something that the Wales summit uh, reaffirmed, and, um, and, and actually prior to the Wales summit, two of the countries that were uh, were most interested in taking the next step towards becoming an alliance member, Georgia and Montenegro, got uh, enhanced 
partnership plans. Uh, George's was, was enshrined at the summit, but both with Montego, it's a work plan that over the course of next year uh, will be, it's, it's an effort that the Alliance will have to work with the Montenegrins to get them to sort of assess where they are and also to get them as close as possible to being ready to take the next step, which would be a membership action plan, and that work's supposed to be done by the end of the calendar year. Next year, as I said, Secretary Hagel was in Georgia at, at, after the Wales Summit, and the Georgians were very pleased with the, with the partnership plan that they received at the summit. And uh, I can't stress enough what a great partner the Georgians are, whether it's uh, in Afghanistan or their willingness to be creative and thinking about ways that they can help us in the Middle East. Uh, Georgia is a, is a terrific partner, and, and truth be told, they're sacrificing and have sacrificed more than many of our NATO allies when it comes to uh, a willingness to take casualties and run risks in places like Afghanistan. On Ukraine, my recollection is Ukraine, actually, there's, there's RADA legislation that, that says that NATO membership is not something they're seeking right now. And President Poroshenko has made that clear as well in his, in his conversations with us, that they are not seeking NATO membership. That said, uh, we do have a strong partnership uh, with Ukraine, and in fact, there's been somewhat of a misunderstanding in, in <coughs> within Ukraine. Uh, they've been asking for non uh, uh, major, what's a major, major non NATO, major non -NATO ally. ally status, and in fact, the 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 level of cooperation they already <coughs> have with NATO through the NATO Ukraine Commission, through the the other partnership efforts we have gives them things that are far beyond the, the major, uh, the major non-NATO allied status. And in fact, if we were to if they were to get that status, it would signal that they don't have transatlantic aspirations, because that status is given to countries that aren't seeking to be part of the transatlantic community. So we've been working with them to say they need to, this, we completely agree that we want them to be part of the transatlantic community, and we want them to have a close partnership with NATO, and that for the moment, NATO membership is not on the table uh, on either side. Uh, so let's work on that and not get hung up on the, on the sort of this label that actually would not make a bit of difference. In fact, it would be less than what they currently have with NATO. And has Europe and the U.S. given up and decided to see the ceasefire line as essentially? No, 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 not at all. In fact, my colleague, Tori Newland, is as you probably all know, has is, is been in Kiev for the last couple of days uh, meeting with the Ukrainian government. Um, and we've been very clear that, that it's absolutely critical to have an international border, international recognized border, and a border that is fully monitored uh, by the OSC. So we have not conceded at all that, that the ceasefire line, this internal line, uh, is going to be the new border. We're seeking for this not to be a frozen conflict. Uh, and that's um, something Tori has been working on uh, with the Ukrainian government over the last couple of days, and we will also obviously working with the OSC, who will be taking a lead role in the monitoring. In the far back left there. Uh, good morning, uh, thank you for doing this. Uh, my question is, uh, um, there are uh, I'm Your a mic not on there. Uh, I'm Igor Dunaevsky, a reporter for a Russian newspaper. My question is, uh, you mentioned some that uh, United States still has uh, interest to work with Russia on a number of issues like uh, chemical weapons in Syria or Iran. Uh, so, uh, do you assess uh, whether uh, Russia can play a role uh, in um, U.S. support uh, to build a coalition to fight ISIS in uh, Iraq and Syria? Uh, were there any contacts with, um, between defense ministries of U.S. and Russia? And uh, if uh, this option is on the table, or just... Thank you. So, the role Russia can play is pretty straightforward in the support of the Assad regime. Uh, that's something that we have uh, been... Um, uh, very clear on for many years uh, that uh, Russia's behavior in the region, and particularly its support for Assad, uh, have, has been part of the problem in the overall con con conflict. Uh, even though we have episodes of, of cooperation, in, in like the, in the Syria chemical weapons instance, um, that has been has been fruitful. Uh, overall, Russia's posture has been unhelpful when it comes to the Syria conflict. 
And just to directly answer your, your follow-up question, there's been no contact uh, between the defense ministers uh, on this issue or at anyone at the defense ministry, in either defense ministry at my level or below uh, on this issue. To follow up on, on the uh, ISIS question, I'm, I'm perhaps where the European security and uh, ISIS uh, issues merge is in, of course, Turkey. Um, and we've seen, at least according to New York Times uh, yesterday, that there's some um, concern about the, about the Turks' willingness to engage militarily across the border. Um, and yet, of course, Turkey really is the most directly threatened NATO ally by the circumstances unfolding across its various borders. Um, and at the end of the day, this, we're verging on an Article 5 situation here uh, in, in theory. Um, so uh, I guess my question is twofold. Your, your assessment of the current um, uh, political military uh, context with Turkey on ISIS and how, how much are we on the same page? And then uh, your assessment of the readiness of the Turkish military to engage um, on this issue. So, Sam, this is an issue that uh, the Turks have been seized with for the last several years. Uh, I was out in Ankara almost exactly two years ago uh, with Robert Ford, who's an ambassador to Syria, to, to begin uh, a political military dialogue with the Turks on Syria. And, and all of the uh, associated security concerns that they have uh, about Syria, whether it's the insecurity of their border, whether it's the refugee situation, whether it's a threat from ballistic missiles and, and Syrian air power. Um, so this is a conversation we have been having with the Turks for, for two years. And it's happening among civilians. It's happening at a military to military level. Our European command has had a, a standing committee with the, with the TGS, the Turkish General Staff, for the last several years to talk to them about the various military aspects of the Syrian crisis. That conversation has uh, gone into warp speed over the last month. Uh, really beginning again with the Wales summit, and then uh, Secretary Hagel's trip after Wales, uh, after Wales and Georgia, he went to Turkey. Secretary Kerry was there soon after him, uh, and we've had an intensive uh, uh, round of conversations with them at all different levels uh, in the security field about what they uh, what they're thinking on, uh, regarding Syria and what we can possibly do together. Of course, as you all know, there was a, a hostage situation which when we were there, was still very much uh, uh, in the front of their minds. And that was, a, a, understandably, something that, that they were very focused on. Uh, but now, since thankfully, that has passed. And since also the strategic context has changed considerably, where the United States and our partners are conducting uh, airstrikes in Iraq and also airstrikes in Syria, it opens the conversation space that we're, that we're having with the Turks uh, on these issues. General Allen who is the President's uh, Special Envoy for the, the ISIL Coalition Building. Uh, he and Brett McGurk will be in Ankara uh, later this week to, to continue the conversation uh, with our Turkish partners. Secretary Hagel remains in regular contact with the Defense Minister. Uh, I talk to my counterpart almost daily. Um, so so there's no, there's no uh, absence of, of dialogue and, and discussion. Now, the question is, what are we going to do? Uh, this is a very difficult situation for all of us, and, and uh, uh, we've made very clear we're not going to be putting our ground forces uh, into into Syria. And right now, the Turks are also not uh, uh, engaged on the ground in Syria. So, uh, as we're thinking through the challenge, and as we're thinking through the various things that we can do together, and Turkey's parliament voted earlier this week uh, to be <coughs> part of, or what? Okay, this was last week to be part of the. Uh, coalition and and now they're sorting through exactly what that's going to mean and that's the conversation that we're having with them about what the specific uh, capabilities they'd be willing to contribute to the coalition would be and so all I can say is that um, uh, Turkey is is a key partner it, it is absolutely going to be part of the solution in Syria it has to be because as you said, it's, it's their border. Uh, we've worked hard over the last several years to help reassure the Turks, defend the Turks. That's why a U.S. Patriot battery uh, has been in Turkey for almost two years now as part of a NATO mission with the Germans and the Dutch uh, to help protect Turkey from the threat of ballistic missiles coming from uh, Syria. And we're, we've been happy to do that, and we're going to continue doing that as long as the threat exists. Thanks. Let's uh, 
In that far back left over there. Hi, my name is Alex Sanchez. I'm a senior fellow at the Council on Hemispheric Affairs. I guess my question is about Black Sea geopolitics and what do you see you, the U.S. relations with countries like Romania, like Bulgaria, and the U.S. as a base, or in Constanta, Bulgaria is also a silver guardian, uh, silver guardian exercises in April, I believe, or March. Um, do you think that they, we're seeing the further militarization of the Black Sea? Thank you. Uh, well, I think that our, our Black Sea allies, uh, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, uh, Ukraine, uh, remain uh, critically important. I, I think um, uh, having a, kind of a, a Black Sea strategy is something that, that we are actively pursuing because we want all those allies to be reassured. We want all those allies to uh, uh, continue the deep cooperation that, that we have with them. Secretary Hayden was in Romania earlier this summer. Uh, we, went, we were in Constanta and we, we had the opportunity to visit uh, a U.S. Uh, uh, naval vessel that was, that was uh, docked in Constanta. And as, as you alluded to, we've had a series of naval exercises on the Black Sea uh, that, that were previously scheduled, but that were important to conduct in the context of, of the Ukraine crisis. One of the issues we'll be working with our Ukrainian friends on uh, as our defense relationship grows is how we can help uh, revive their navy, which was essentially taken over by the Russians, either destroyed or taken over by the Russians. Uh, so uh, working with them on their navy is something we're very interested in. So uh, a lot of the conversation when it comes to reassuring our Central and Eastern European partners is directed, obviously, to the Ukrainians, but then also up north to the Balts and the Poles. That's absolutely appropriate, but you're, you are right. Uh, you mentioned, and we will not forget uh, the Bulgarians and the Romanians in particular, and that's why I think Romania actually has had, had a lot of high-level visits here. The Vice President was there, as said, Secretary Hayden was there. Uh, and the Bulgarians, as you know, has had, have had um, uh, an interim government, and they've just had elections, so trying to, in terms of working a, a deeper program with them, we need a new government to, to do that, but that's something we're very interested in. There's one over here. Over here. Might be our last. Yeah. Excuse me. <coughs> Two more. Two more. All Two right. More. We'll take them both together. Yeah. Hey, Derek. Mark Kimmett. Um, I'd like to follow up on the earlier question about Turkey and ISIL. I know that you not only have a foot in Yukon AOR, but also in Sentom AOR, also in your Wisconsin. There's a lot of noise that's associated with what's going on right now in northern Syria with Kobani. Some would suggest that we're not providing sufficient support because of the YDG, that both of those groups have an association with PKK, which is a declared terrorist organization. Hence, we won't help. Uh, number two, there's a suggestion that the enemy is adapting on the ground and is recognizing how to outwit our air power. And number three, there's a suggestion that this reveals a fundamental flaw in the president's strategy with regards to what's going on in Syria. Can you try to put this all together for us so we can have a, a <laughs> solid answer from the administration? All right, thanks, Mark. <laughs> um, let me just hit that while okay, it's yeah. on my mind, and yeah. then we'll do the one last question, which is always the question that gets you in trouble, but yeah. I'll do one last question. Uh, so, Mark, on, um, on uh, the second question, which was uh, uh, the the... Uh, they, they not doing anything. Question. Not doing anything. Yeah, there are three parts, right? Not doing the. We've we've conducted, uh, I think, ten strikes just since Saturday around Kobani. I think we were around twenty strikes total around around Kobani. Uh, there is a limited amount that you can do in the air. Chairman Dempsey, our military commanders, have been very very clear on that. You know this very well. I mean, we can do a lot from the air. We have a tremendous capability. But there's only so much you can do from the air alone. One of the challenges is, is we're not there on the ground. The difference between Iraq and Syria is in Iraq, uh, we have a ground element. We collectively, it's not the US, but it's, it's working with uh, the Peshmerga or the ISF uh, in, in some cases uh, to work with them in a, more of an air ground campaign. We don't have that in Syria. That's one of the reasons, that is the reason why we've, we're seeking $500 million from our Congress to help build up a viable, capable Syrian military opposition. Uh, that's an effort that is, we're, we're, we're slowly kind of laying the groundwork for, but we got to get the money uh, before uh, we, can, we can move out on that. Um, and when <coughs> Congress was able to pass some legislation that, that allowed us to start, but when Congress comes back, they're going to be asking us some tough questions, as they should. 
uh, about that program, and we're going to have to show progress there. So there is a limited amount we can do by the air. Uh, this is something we're talking to our Turkish friends about. As, as you noted, it is a complicated situation uh, for Turkey, and, and as we've seen all seen on CNN, they're lined up on the border uh, to ensure that the, the ISIL problem doesn't flow in. But, uh, so it's not a flaw in the strategy at all, um, but it does represent the limits of what we can do, uh, uh, and, and uh, we've been very clear about that. And that's and there's only so much we can do through the air, and that this is going to take a long, long, long time. And it's why we need to have a viable, capable uh, ground force, uh, indigenous ground force, and that's what we're seeking to create. Last one. Over here in the front row. You can just, again. Yeah. Um, just a few weeks ago, Igor Tenek, a voice of American Russian service, um, just a few weeks ago, a ceasefire between the pro Russian separatists and the Ukrainian military was signed in Minsk. However, uh, there's some heavy fighting going on these days, uh, breaking that ceasefire, obviously, in the Ukraine's east. And the Russian media is reporting that it's the Ukrainian military that is bombarding constantly and shelling the civilian. Um, Quarters in, uh, in Donetsk and the adjacent cities. Uh, the Ukrainian mil uh, media is reporting that it's the pro Russian separatists that are trying to take over the uh, airport in the um, Donetsk region that is currently controlled by, by the uh, Ukrainian military. Uh, is there any evidence, uh, intel evidence, that the United States or its uh, NATO partners have possessed these days? Who is the initiator? Who is the attacker in this situation? Uh, well, I'm obviously not going to get into intelligence uh, here, but, but what I can say is that uh, it's clear that, that Russian forces have been in Ukraine, violating an international border, uh, supporting Ukrainian separatists uh, with material and in some per in direct uh, uh, assistance in the form of personnel. That's unacceptable. That's the reason why uh, we've been clear, both in word and deed, that, that Russia needs to be punished for that, uh, that behavior. There is a ceasefire. We are working very closely with the Ukrainian government to ensure that that ceasefire is implemented and that uh, the, the basic aspects of that ceasefire, all Russian personnel out of eastern Ukraine, all heavy material out of eastern Ukraine, and an internationally recognized border that is fully monitored by uh, the OSCE. That, that those basic elements are what's going to make for a lasting ceasefire. So then, there, then a political process that President Poroshenko has been very clear that he uh, wants to pursue with uh, those who reside in eastern Ukraine can commence. That's what we're seeking. On that note, thank you very much, Derek. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.